You can listen to the Backward Compatible Podcast anytime, anywhere, in any way you like. Subscribe and listen to us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Then, join the discussion. Um, but yeah, I, I don't usually read well, books. This week on Backward Compatible... Trey Cooper joins us to share his impressions of Dragon Age Inquisition and the new teaser trailer for Star Wars The Force Awakens. Plus, Jim devises a numbers game that shows just how little Chris and Trey know about Star Wars and video games. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Backward Compatible. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to podcast number 18. As always, I am Chris, and I'm joined once again by Jim. I'm here uh, via Skype, as usual. And uh, today we've got a new guest on the podcast. This is uh, Trey Cooper. So, Trey, how about you introduce yourself? Um, I will be going back to school at UTD this coming January. I've been a student here for three years. My background is in film. I have a degree from the Vancouver Film School in film production. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's pretty big. <laughs> yeah, and then I um, decided I kind of wanted to get into game design, so awesome. I decided to come to UTD. Sweet. Cool. Uh, so, Jim, I hear you've got a warm-up game for us today. Uh, yeah, I've got a little game for us uh, that we can play, maybe learn a, little, learn a little bit about Trey, and Trey, you can learn a little bit about, uh, about us, or at least about Chris. I'm going to be sort of playing the, uh, the host of this game. Um, this is going to be embarrassing for me. I can already tell. <laughs> well, actually, you don't necessarily have to know anything to win this game. Technically, then I will, I will be great. Then <laughs> <laughs> all you have to do is 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 sort of try to judge what the other person, what you think the other person knows. Okay. So uh-huh. here here's how it works. Um, essentially, I'm going to ask you a question, and we're going to go back and forth. It's either going to be about video games or Star Wars. A few of these are about both because our discussion is going to um, sort of morph into a general Star Wars discussion later on in the podcast. Um, and uh, I'll ask you this question. It'll, every answer will be a number-based answer. Um, and the other person, after you give your answer, will have to say if they think that the number that was given was either too high or too low. And then I'll give you the answer. And then if they were right, um, they get the points. If, if uh, you were right or basically you were closer than them, you get the points. Okay. Makes sense? Sounds like the price is right. Kind of like the price is right, only you can go over. Okay. <laughs> so very right. similar, yes. But uh, since you both are in the, in the same room, you can kind of look. Maybe you don't think that he's very sure about his choice, and so uh, you know you kind of you feel a little more confident about, about whether he's higher or lower. Um, okay, but let's go ahead and get started. So right. uh, I'm going to start off um, asking well, – I'm going to kind of go back and forth between you two. And I'm actually going to ask the video game questions to you, Trey, and I want to ask the Star Wars questions to Chris. Okay. That might be a little more interesting. So, um, first question. Uh, Trey, how many games have been made that feature Mario as a main character, a supporting character, or even in a cameo role? And uh, please consider (laughs) all versions of each game. In other words, if there was a a re-release of the game or a port to another system... Count those that is as a massive separate number. Versions. Yeah, it's, it's huge. I'm not even going to try and, and count in my head. <laughs> but how huge is it? Uh, oh my god! Even if it's a re-release. So Trey's giving the number, not you, Jim. Is that right? Yes, Trey. You give the number, and then Chris, you're going to say if you think that the number that Trey gave is too high, or well, you're going to say that if you if you think the real number is higher or lower than I got Trey's. Okay, gotcha. I'm going to say. 200. 200. I think that. So you're going to say, think, so you're going with a flat 200? Yeah. Okay, Chris? I think that's too low. So you think that the number of Mario games is higher? I think it confirm. is greater than 200, yes. Okay. Chris, you get the point. That the uh, actual number is 265. I was going to say 250. Mm. I, was, uh, I, was, was I, I probably still would have guessed higher <laughs> in that case. You still would have won. <laughs> yeah. Mm. All right. Okay, so that's uh, currently, let me let me get a tally here. All right, so that's one point for Chris. Now, there is a bonus question, and uh, oh, okay. this bonus question is, 
Alt is going to go do basically whoever lost that round to the chance for them to get a point back. Um, so Trey, this is your question again. Um, out of those games, those 265 Mario games, which one had the most ports, remakes, and re-releases? Super Mario Brothers. That's incorrect. Do you want to guess for, for no points? Chris, do you want to take a guess? Um, Mario 64? No. Donkey Kong. Oh. oh Donkey Kong. Nice. There, there's yeah. over 20 <laughs> Donkey Kong, <laughs> Donkey yeah, Kong re-releases. Mm. Yeah. Um, Actually, okay. your guess was going to be mine. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, well, it was kind of a trick question, because Super Mario Bros. would be kind of obvious. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, Chris, this question goes to you. All right. Um, and this is our Star Wars question. It's actually also a video game question. Um, in what year was the release of the first video game to use the Star Wars license? The first year. And it is, um, I did say video game, so note right. that that, spe- that specification. I'm going to go with 1987. 1987. Okay. Uh, Trey, do you think that uh, that that year is... Well, do you think that the year it came before 1987 or after? I think it came before 1987. Before? I think it's too too late. Okay. Trey, uh, you get the point. The actual year was 1982. Uh, was okay. it an arcade game or... Well, that's that's actually going to be the follow-up question, and it actually goes to oh. Chris. Chris, can you possibly name that game? Uh, if you don't know, obviously, just say. I, I think I think it was, I think it was arcade, um, and I know the game was about flying an X-wing on the Death Star trench run. Um, is it called X-wing? That is incorrect. Trey, ah. do you want to just throw a guess out there for no points? Is it called Star Wars, the arcade game? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, that's also wrong. And in fact, uh, that game you described is not the first Star Wars game. Uh, oh, the first right. one was actually called Star Wars, the Empire Strikes Back. Mm. And it is a scrolling shooter for the Atari 2600. It takes place oh. entirely on the ice planet Hoth. You basically fly the snow speeder and try to shoot down at ass. Okay, so it wasn't <laughs> we were, it was we, an arcade we, game. We were entirely right. wrong. I, I got the conversation <laughs> off track by even saying arcade game. <laughs> the, the arcade game was one of the first, but it wasn't the first. Gotcha. All right. Uh, the arcade game was probably the, the most notable early Star Wars game, so that was a good guess. Um, okay, right. so we're back to Trey. The, the score is currently tied. How many licensed songs have been featured in the entire Grand Theft Auto series? Oh my god. <laughs> the entire series. And that includes any expansions. Um, the recent Grand Theft Auto 5 was, re- was uh, re-released on Xbox One and PS4, and they added new songs to that uh, to that version. This includes all of those songs. Have you played uh, the Grand Theft Auto series, Trey? I've literally only beaten one Grand Theft Auto game, and it was Grand Theft Auto 4. Okay. You've beaten more than I have. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I played Grand Theft Auto 5 until I felt too dirty, and I had to stop. Okay. So, so you've played, because I know those games are, that's definitely a series that some people play. A lot of people play, I guess I, I should say. A lot of people play it, but not everyone actually goes all the way through and beats them because there's so much to do. Right. So I think I think Bethesda has some games like that, like a lot of the Elder Scrolls series is kind of that way for some people, for me in particular. I mean, I, I played three, and I thought it was a lot of fun, didn't beat it. Then I completely stopped liking the series after that. Hmm. I lost all interest in it. And then I really liked the story in four, so I actually saw that to the end. But four it's not something I typically story. look up to, hmm. look up to, look forward to. Hmm. I really um, ended up loving the, the Grand Theft Auto V story. But, um, but go ahead. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely dark, I'll say that. Uh, but go ahead. Do you have a guess for the number of licensed songs in the entire series? Yeah, let's say 1,500. Ooh. <laughs> 1,500. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to guess that the actual number is lower than that. Uh, Chris, you're actually right. The actual number is 1,235. Still more than I thought, so I <laughs> you, said you weren't thousand. that far off. I should have said 1,000. I still would have said lower. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that was actually a pretty close guess. Um, Pity yeah, points. actually, when I was when I was putting the this this number together, it it took a little bit more time than I expected because there's I had to actually count some of the sound lists for some of these games. Um, oh, jeez! So as, as you can probably imagine, the, uh, the soundtracks got progressively more expansive as the series went on. Uh, right. The original yeah. Grand Theft Auto Three had several songs that were actually not licensed; they were original songs by um, the developers. They sort of put together some parody songs. And so right. I only counted the ones that were licensed, but 
they kind of had this mixture. There were only 35 in the original Grand Theft Auto 3. And in Grand Theft Auto 5, there was 241. So it's really been growing as the series has progressed. Um, for the bonus question, uh, this was going to go to Trey because uh, you didn't get the point last time. Which soundtrack that was released as a box set, which doesn't tell you much, they kind of all work, um, has proven most successful? San Andreas. That is incorrect. Do you want to throw out a guess for no points, Chris? Um, three? Nope, it's Vice City. Ah. Uh, Vice City. I forgot, I forgot that even existed. <laughs> yeah, uh, all that 80s music. Really, really popular. <laughs> um, okay. I didn't even play so, that. So, um, <laughs> next question, we're going to go um, to Chris. All right. How many times has the original Star Wars film been released theatrically? Um, 20? 20? Yeah. Okay. So your guess is that it's been it's been released theatrically 20 times. It's probably way too high. <laughs> well, it's up, it's, but yeah. It's up to you. Your choice. Okay. Um, Trey, what do you think? Is it the, the real number higher or lower? I think it's lower. Okay. You get the point, Trey. <laughs> um, do you have, you want to you want to hazard a guess on just how low? Um, well, that I know of, it's been released four times, but okay. I don't. I assume that there's times that I don't know about. Uh, it's actually released six times in theaters. Okay. So it was it was, was it was close. released, of course, originally in 1977, but then it was re-released in 1978, again in 1979, again in ni- 1981. And then once more in 1982, and then of course we had the special edition in 1997. Okay. Uh, and this kind of leads into my follow-up bonus question, which goes uh, to Chris: What year was it? Was uh, the film rebranded Episode Four: A New Hope? Huh. Which of course accompanies um, its theatrical release. That, in case that wasn't clear, I right, gave you those right. years already, so you kind of yeah. have an idea. <laughs> I wasn't I didn't paying want attention. You, I actually didn't want you guessing. Like, well. <laughs> That's too bad. That's my bad. <laughs> um, nineteen eighty four. Um, no, it was nineteen eighty one. Okay, nineteen eighty one. Which at this um, point, the listeners are wondering why we decided to talk about Star Wars or video games. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, these were not necessarily supposed to be that easy, but a um, little bit of little well, bit mission of, uh, successful. Trippy, I hope. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. Um, so next one, we're going to go um, over to Trey. It's the video game question. So we only got a few more okay. left, and currently the score is tied at 2-2. So you're actually both doing pretty well, comparatively. Um, how many copies did E.T. the Extraterrestrial sell for the Atari 2600? Um, as you remember, in case you're not aware of the story of E.T., it was sort of one of the games that was blamed for the... Uh, video game crash, uh, the console crash of 1983, right? Uh, along yeah. with games like Pac-Man, uh, the Pac-Man port, of course. Right. And this is not a trick question. I, it's, I don't mean like in the future or something. I mean oh, no, no. during that I, period. It's really tiny. Right. I'm just trying to think. I'm going to say 300, which is probably generous. Or maybe not. 300? You yeah. think it only sold 300 copies? That's what I'm. That's what I'm saying. Obviously, I am incorrect. Oh no, because I was actually thinking like maybe somewhere or maybe, I'm, maybe too, I'm trying so. to trick you. Maybe I'm trying to trick you into changing your answer. You, you, you kind of like hit that that uh, what do they call it? Embedding like the uh, the split. Like you kind of hit that where like you're not sure which way you should go. Yeah. yeah so I know it's a really small number. Yeah. But I'm going to say 300. I'm going to guess more than 300. Okay, Chris, you are right. Okay. It is more than three hundred. Do you want to you want to go ahead and give us your your quick guess about just how much more than three hundred? I'm gonna guess like a thousand. A thousand? Uh, higher than that. Uh, under nine thousand. The actual number. Uh, the actual number was uh, that of copies sold was one point five million. What? Oh, wow. Yes. And that, in fact, that bankrupted in, them. That's not even bad. Well, I'll, I'll explain it. See, actually, it's mm. not bad. It was actually a top 10 bestseller for the Atari 2600. But what happened was, first of all, the game was critically panned. So there were a lot right. of people that were very, very annoyed with Atari. For well, it's very horrible. When they it was game. made like, the guy made it in like a day. <laughs> oh, it was, it's horrible. I, I've played it. It's really bad. Yeah. Um, but the other problem was that Atari actually produced, which was so stupid, 5 million copies of the game. So even yeah, like though, they didn't even have that many consoles, right? Okay. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was insane. 
and no game was going to sell. I mean, they actually did have, I think, one of their games sold that much. Um, I want to say it was Pac-Man, but um, it was a ridiculous number of, of copies to make, and of course, they couldn't sell them all, so they ended up having to, that's why they had to keep throwing them out. All these stores had so many copies that they keep had to keep discounting them, trying to get people to buy them. There just wasn't enough interest. 1.5 million is a lot, but there wasn't enough interest for it. So that kind of disillusioned a lot of people. All right, so uh, this is the final question. Uh, it's, it's currently, Chris, you're in the lead. You can win this. There actually are two more questions because there's a bonus. Um, British actor Sebastian Shaw is perhaps best known for his portrayal of an unmasked Darth Vader in an emotional scene at the end of Return of the Jedi. How long did Shaw appear on screen during this scene? Uh, 60 seconds. Okay, 60 seconds. Is that your final answer? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Trey, higher or lower? Are we only talking about that one scene, or does this total film we're, time? We're only talking about that one scene. The only other scene that he appeared in in Return of the Jedi was at the very, very end, when he uh, was the ghostly apparition, the Force apparition. Right. I'm not talking well, about that scene. Used to be. <laughs> yeah, it, it, in my head canon, he's still there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, you said how long? 60 seconds. That's right about how long I would think. Mm-hmm. It's not a very long scene. Um, I'm going to say lower. Lower? Yeah. All right, Chris, you get the points. Ah. <laughs> it was actually um, higher. It was two minutes and seven seconds. Wow. Way yeah. longer than I would have thought. I was trying to replay the scene in my head. It didn't seem like it was that long. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it, it was. it's still a very short scene. Um, actually, kind of interesting tidbit about that scene too is uh, Sebastian Shaw he had been a, um, mo- a lot, mostly had done a lot of theater acting um, and he ended up getting by far the most positive fan response from that role he got a whole bunch of fan mail of course they made an action figure out of him <laughs> right and uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah he just had so, he had so, like so much of a, of a fan response off of just a couple of minutes in this one movie uh, despite his entire career so it's kind of interesting um so, bonus question, Trey, for, uh, this is just sort of a, a fun point, you, you actually can't win the game, but uh, you might still be able I'm to crying. get something off of this. <laughs> um, how many words of dialogue did Shaw have total in Return of the Jedi? Oh my god. <laughs> uh, ten. <laughs> um, no, it was actually 24. Ah. But yeah, it was a very, it was a very short scene, emotional scene. So I think this is probably a good time for us to bring in our uh, sort of first topic of the day, which is quite related to this. Uh, Jim already mentioned it. Um, uh, Star Wars, obviously the uh, the new teaser trailer for The Force Awakens just came out, um, and everyone on the internet is going nuts with speculation. And with, I didn't even uh, know they were making a new Star Wars. <laughs> wow, <laughs> is that going on. <laughs> um, I think the the lightsaber has been kind of a particularly contentious point of uh, discussion. Of course, it is. Yeah. yeah. The cross guard, right there with the cross guard. Yeah, I have my own theory on that, but uh, I guess first, Jim, do you have any uh, impressions of the trailer? Um, that was one of the things that stood out to me quite a bit was that was the lightsaber. Um, I kind of liked the way that it had that sort of um, thin, almost like uh, almost like a weak energy pulse to it. That was something you mentioned as well. We talked about it a bit when we were playing our Star Wars RPG uh, mm. last weekend. Um, and it's something that, that you know stood out more for me when I went back and rewatched it. And I kind of like that look. Um, mm-hmm. The cross guard itself seems silly. Like I don't really like its look. Like I understand that it makes sense um, to have a sword with a cross guard. I mean, it is. It theoretically would be more effective in terms of um, if you were actually just using a lightsaber as a normal person using a sword. But you are also supposed to be having the force kind of. Um, be, be its own force of protection in a sense so it doesn't seem like a little bit unnecessary I kind of thought if you're going to go with a cross guard and you're going to have a weaker pulse why not just have you know why, why couldn't they develop some sort of like stronger saber blade that had an even bigger amount of energy coming through it because it almost looks like that's what they wanted to do is have like a bigger sword with more energy and they just kind of chickened out and made it cross guard mm. was that your impression? <laughs> 
sort of, 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 well, the, of the design itself, not the interview. <laughs> Well, my, my impression when I first saw it, um, and this might tie into some speculation there's been, and we'll probably touch on this in a little bit, of um, how they're kind of moving away from the extended universe as it's been established and kind of making the films have their own canon. Mm-hmm. Um, and my thought is that, um, from what I've heard, that it sounds like... Uh, Rather than, like, in the extended universe when Luke goes on to found a new Jedi Academy and, like, trains up all these new Jedi and a new Sith Order and all this different stuff, um, I get the impression that they're actually kind of going the opposite route, where Luke is kind of, like, the last Jedi and stays the last Jedi. Um, This might be debunked when we actually see more. Um, But my thought is that you've got some guy who's discovered the dark side and wants to build a lightsaber but doesn't know how it was done back in the day. Um, And so rather than using, like, a force crystal and having all that sort of stuff, maybe he's just constructed his own take on a lightsaber. Um, And I thought that the cross guards may or may not actually be cross guards. They might actually be, like, exhaust of some sort. Um, Hmm. Because looking at the blade itself, it looked like some sort of, like, you know, um, charged plasmid or something like that. Um, I don't know if that's the right word I'm looking for. (laughs) plasmaoid or something like that um but but it looked like it was very unstable the energy and i thought that might be because of sort of amateurish construction yeah you you don't think that just to get this this point in real quick you don't think that the name of the of the third or i guess the sixth film uh return of the jedi wasn't implying that there was going to be a new jedi order though because it, it isn't called return of a jedi it was called return of the jedi i kind of I mean, I see what you're saying there. My thought was that um, that could mean, though, that like the Jedi Order has been restored in this one person because it was completely gone, effectively, before after Obi Wan. Um, so I don't know. And, and there is no, there's a, another movie. Mm-hmm. And there is no, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of like it'd be like the Return of the Batman. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's the Return of the idea of the Jedi, and maybe not so much of the Order. Well, it definitely okay. doesn't seem from anything that we've heard leaked about the movie mm-hmm. or that we've that we've seen so far that there's a restored Jedi order and obviously the same what well, happened in real time so it's like what 20 30 years have gone by mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. 40 years um, so it doesn't look like the Jedi order has returned right. in any way mm-hmm. um, I, I I actually thought that kind of like you it was it was about a more crude design mm-hmm. but I actually had a feeling it was going going to be because they were going to go back to the combat roots of the first film. The first mm-hmm. film, it's actually sometimes like painful to watch some of the early Jedi or the lightsaber fights. Right. Yeah. They're just very poorly choreographed mm-hmm. and uh, especially that's one thing that the the new the prequels did very well was mm-hmm. they had, you know, incredibly well choreographed um, lightsaber fights. Right. So I think putting the cross guard on it really invokes that very medieval mm-hmm. sword look and I have a feeling we're going to see a lot of lightsaber fighting that feels like that. Like they're mm. going to feel it's kind of more like big, slash. heavy yeah. weapons. Yeah, and I think mm-hmm. that also is going to say a lot about the combat style of this person. You know, mm-hmm. I think he's basically like wielding the jet, the lightsaber equivalent of a great sword. Mm. And it's going to, that's how, <coughs> I think that's the reason why they want that design. Cool. I feel like the design's going to go, I feel like a lot of people are going to be mollified when they see the design in action. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It'll just make more sense sure, sure. once you see him like, you know, double handing this lightsaber. Yeah, yeah. So, cool. I, I like could, that. Thought. I could see that actually. That that does make that does make some sense that that they could be moving in that direction. Um, that kind of feeds into my thought that that it seemed almost like they wanted to make you know a thicker energy blade itself. I guess they maybe like a great thought sword. that would, right, but maybe they thought that would look too hokey if they had like a massive energy blade. Right, mm-hmm. and while it was awesome to see you know a lightsaber or a real live action lightsaber after so many years. Um, as far as them trying to make it bigger and cooler or whatever, you know, they already did that with, with Darth Maul. Mm-hmm. That nobody really cares anymore. Mm-hmm. Then they had General Grievous with the bazillion lightsabers. And oh. now you have Star Wars Rebels mm-hmm. where the Inquisitor has that amazing lightsaber. I've not seen that one. Can you describe it? Um, yeah, it's like, uh, imagine like Darth Maul's lightsaber, mm-hmm. but on like a rotating blade so oh, it like, can spin around. Right, that one. Cool, yeah, cool. Yeah. Awesome. So Strange. that's that's yeah, it's a really cool lightsaber. Mm-hmm. I think it would have been over the top of the movie, but it looks really cool in mm-hmm. Rebels. Awesome. Yeah, I've, I've not seen uh, I've not seen any of Rebels. Uh, is it is it actually? Is it, it's the new um, the the three three D animated um, Star Wars series. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, is that any good? Did you? Uh, well, I mean, I, I saw I Clone mean, Wars. I love, that was the last one. I, I love it. I, I love Clone Wars. Also, I think it has its its place in you know in the Star Wars universe. Yeah, that was very enjoyable. I have only seen a couple episodes of Rebels, but what I've seen so far, I really, really liked. 
I, I I'm planning to wait and then I'll just binge watch all of it. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, I've done I've done the same thing uh, with with series as well. I, I actually binge watched uh, Clone Wars because um, I didn't really like the few episodes that I had seen um, when it was mm-hmm. originally showing, and then I kind of went back and watched it all on Netflix. And um, while I wouldn't say that it's it, it has it's consistently a great show, I will say that it was um, actually pretty good along the way. So I ended up enjoying it a lot more than I thought I would. I mean, I'm the kind of guy who literally will play the worst Star Wars video game just to get any other Star Wars story. Right, right. I mean, I played through Star Wars Obi-Wan on the original Xbox, <laughs> which is like the worst, most horrible game ever. Is that like uh, episode one through three, Obi-Wan? Or? Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. It takes place during the prequels. I think it came out right after episode one. Uh-huh. I played all the licensed games for The <laughs> Phantom Menace. For, they're all horrible. <laughs> and I knew that while I was playing them, and I still did it anyway. I, I remember slowly grinding my way through The Phantom Menace on a PC. Mm-hmm. Um, That's what I did. And having to use cheats and stuff because it was just like I was too young to be able to do anything on there. So. It was also really buggy, and I had like <laughs> my dad had a really old computer, uh-huh. and this was way before kids would have even thought about having their own computers. Sure. So we had the one in the family room, and it was really horrible, <laughs> and it like it was like watching a slideshow. But, yeah, <laughs> awesome. I still did it. Yep. Um, so kind of coming back to the um, the teaser, I guess. Uh, do you guys have any other impressions from that in general? I want to say that whenever I first saw it, I saw it on my cell phone mm. because I didn't. I knew that they had said it was going to come out online, mm-hmm. but I had to be at work early in the morning, mm-hmm. and I got to work, and then I said, and one was like, "Oh, it's online now," mm-hmm. and they blocked it on my work computer. Every <laughs> single site, it was blocked. And it was blocked under category games, which was really weird. Uh-huh. Um, so I had, I literally put myself like on lunch break at like eight o'clock in the morning <laughs> and went and got my headset and watched it on my phone uh-huh. and when i watched it on my phone the opening shot of um uh, what's the guy's name um i forget the actor's name but yeah the storm the boyega he, uh, i always pronounce it wrong yeah, anyway, you know what i'm talking about yeah, the stormtrooper yeah. and uh when it on my little bitty phone when it popped john, up john boyega yeah. john boyega okay um when it popped up For some reason, it seemed like it was supposed to be silly. Mm. And so it goes from what, to me on the small phone, looked like a really silly shot Mm -hmm. to then the droid, which is kind of cute and adorable or whatever. And then, and then it all of a sudden got really dark Mm. and I just, it didn't feel like any of it worked at all. Uh Like, this is so weird. It's like, he's trying to show that he's really, it's going to be all funny and jokey and it's going to be really dark. Uh But then as soon as I got home mm-hmm. and I watched it 50 more times <laughs> on my big giant TV with surround sound turned on, nice. then I realized that on, I was just wrong. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like right, right. the opening shot is not supposed to be mm-hmm. whatever. You know, it's supposed to be kind of confusing and mysterious mm-hmm. or whatever. Sure. And um, also show you that the stormtroopers do not look like the clone troopers that mm-hmm. we were introduced to before. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it goes to a very classic sparse, Star Wars feel a lot of big, wide open, mm-hmm. gorgeously framed sci-fi things. It could be paintings. Nice. Um, along with that kind of more modern, mm-hmm. gritty look at the stormtroopers, basically about mm-hmm. to deploy out of some kind of ship. Right. Right. So it had. I think it did a great job of, of showing how it was going to be adhering to that classic look of Star Wars. Mm-hmm. It wasn't going to be be crammed full of CGI and mm-hmm. every, little things in every single inch of the frame that are animated. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also showing there's going to be a little bit of the new modern style, and of course the you know the, the lightsaber that we got to see at the end. Yeah, right. And do you, I, um, do you think, I really love the? Oh. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Jim. Oh, I was just going to ask. Do you are you um, certain that Boyega is actually playing a stormtrooper and not just someone that might have might have been masquerading as one? No, that's actually what my first thought was. That's why I thought it was jokey because mm-hmm. the whole scene when when. Uh, Luke and Han are dressed as stormtroopers mm-hmm. is kind of funny. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of yeah. comical. So I think that's where my my mind was going immediately with that. And the small screen, I couldn't really see the expression on his face or anything. Mm-hmm. But I definitely thought that. But I'm just so really like the fan theory that he's a stormtrooper and the force kind of like wakes up in him mm-hmm. and he has to like go seek out you know, Luke or whoever it is. Mm-hmm. I really like that idea so much that I'm just going to pretend like that's what the plot of the movie yeah. is for right now. I think yeah. that was um, what Badass Digest, I think it was. They yeah. had that mm-hmm. little, like, one paragraph, sort of like, okay, here's the opening scene based on the treatment we've read. Yeah. Um, I think that's where those fan theories are coming from. So if you're wondering what we're talking about, listeners, that's uh, that's what we're referring to. So They're pretty accurate at Badass Digest. Mm-hmm. So 
Yeah. It seems like so far they haven't been wrong. So Exactly. Um, and I, I remember, I didn't remember the details of what I had heard, but I remember seeing the trailer and thinking like, oh, well, there's the Stormtrooper and yeah. you know, that sort of thing. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember uh, when I first heard about the trailer, I've been, of course, was really interested in checking it out. But um, I don't know if y'all are aware, but there was actually a fake trailer that came out online about mm-hmm. um, a few hours before. It might have been more than a few hours before the the uh, the actual real trailer, and it ended up getting over three million views. It might even be more I, at this point. I actually. Um the, the morning when the trailer came out, I hopped on YouTube to see if I could find it, and I just Googled, um, you know, Star Wars The Force Awakens trailer, thinking that clearly it would be, like, the first thing to pop up. No, it up. wasn't. It was the it fake one. It was the fake it was one. The I fake watched one. the fake one. I'm like, yes. this looks fake. I'm not sure if this the, is the real one. I like, the, the and thing. I walked away. I got some water. I'm like, that couldn't have been the real one. I so turned I it off after, and, like, 20 seconds. <laughs> yeah. I was like, there's no way. Yeah. It, it definitely seemed fake, uh, but I actually was intrigued by the con- by the um, the concept of having, you know, older Luke sort of um, having the same sort of like Obi Wan sort of uh, countenance about him. So I wonder. I mean, I don't know if that's where they're going to go with his character in um, Force Awakens. I know that he's signed on to have at least a small role. I don't know how big his role is going to be, um, but I do think that would be kind of a nice um, way for the for his character to kind of uh, develop after everything that happened to him in the original trilogy. Um, and Obi Wan being so sort of his uh, mentor that he kind of becomes the Obi Wan character in the, in the new films. I have a feeling he's going to be more like a cross between Obi Wan and like Qui Gon because he was talking about how he had to go like get in shape and stuff for the movie, mm-hmm. and I just don't feel like if it was just like he wanted to thin up a little bit. I mean, he's wearing freaking robes. Yeah, you know, you could cover that. You could cover yeah. that up, and if he just got to slash a couple times, so I have a feeling he's going to be a little bit more active. Mm-hmm. Um, or at least I hope he is. <laughs> we'll see. Overall, I think the trailer. I think one of the one of the big things that people kind of are um, have been critical about is the fact that the trailer didn't really like give a whole lot away. So they're not really sure where they're where it's going. Um, mm-hmm. Which is kind of a good thing because you kind of don't want to know too much going into a movie anyway. Um, at least in my in my opinion, I know we. It's another thing we kind of talked about if the the teaser nature if it was a little. A little too much of a tease, or if it, if it didn't quite tease enough. Uh, where are your thoughts on that? Well, I thought, I mean, for, for a teaser, I was actually astonished at how much it did show. Yeah, we. I was really surprised. I honestly thought it was going to be like one of what I think is still one of the best teaser trailers ever, which was um, the reveal teaser of Abrams' reboot of Star Trek. Mm. The uh, the slow pan out of the Enterprise that they're that they're building. Mm-hmm. I, that was an amazing to me, amazing. That teaser. was pretty cool, yeah. Um, so I thought it was going to be more like that. I thought we were going to get like some kind of Millennium weird thing, and then, yeah. yeah. So the fact that we got stormtroopers, we got a cool new lightsaber, cool depending on who you ask. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got a new lightsaber. Um, we got Tie Fighters. Mm-hmm. We got the Millennium Falcon. We got, of course, the score. I mean, we got we got glimpses of quite a few things. So I thought it kind of hit all the right notes. Mm-hmm. Did you happen to see um, the George Lucas special edition teaser? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that was pretty funny. That was pretty hilarious. Yeah. And I also do think we should talk at least for a second about the droid. Because mm-hmm. it's really funny. I thought that the droid was going to be the thing that got the most ire. Just because it seems like most Star Wars fans were felt so burned by the prequels mm-hmm. because of the kind of jokey... Jar Jar yeah, and all that. Yeah. That yeah. they didn't want any humor in Star Wars at all. Which is <laughs> infuriating to me because... I'm like, Star Wars is a very funny movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, full of very... I mean, C-3PO and R2-D2 are like comic relief characters. You know what I mean? Yeah. They are consistently funny. Mm-hmm. Um, Han's a lot of comic relief. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of... Yeah, their whole relation... The whole dynamic between him and, and Chewbacca is all based around like just snarky banter. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway... So I thought everyone was going to hate it. I've been really shocked that everybody loves the little droid. Like mm-hmm. everybody oh. loves the the droid. I I don't. So I'm going to cut. I got to be someone. Um, I actually do agree with you though that that definitely Star Wars is it, it is a more lighthearted series even the the original prequels. Um, I just think that of course Lucas didn't seem to quite understand um, comic relief in the prequels, um, especially evidence in Phantom Menace. It just kind of mm-hmm. went overboard. Um, a little like sort of went into campy territory and like really childish humor 
But yeah, he was um, like an old man trying to do like a kids show. Like he, had, right. Like he wasn't funny anymore. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But uh, but yeah, you're totally right. There's a lot of a great comic relief in uh, the first three, um, especially the first one. But um, but yeah, it's it, going back to the astromech droid. Uh, it was an astromech, I think, wasn't it? The droid. Well, I had a head of one. Right. Yeah, it looked like I, it. The thing that I didn't really like about it was I didn't really feel it didn't really seem practical to me to have just the bottom part of the droid be that sort of like rolling ball and then have the top kind of stand stationary on t- on top of it. It looked it looked really very silly. I didn't really like that contrast. I thought if they're going to go with that, why don't they just have the entire thing morph into a ball? Sort of like the droids from uh, like the the um, robots from Phantom Menace that kind of like turned into the, the little ball and the kind of the battle droids. droids are yeah. droid because depending on who you yeah. ask. Right, and there I thought, are those droid because right for me. I just kind of thought the design. I wouldn't say necessarily that I thought it was. Uh, it's not going to like ruin the movie for me or anything, but I did think the design seemed pretty hokey. Well, you really just made me look like an idiot there by <laughs> when I said it was universally acclaimed. Most of the internet hasn't been freaking out about the, the robot design as much as the lightsaber. If it's any consolation, I liked it. I liked the design myself. So I, I think that from what we saw in the trailer, I mean, this is we're getting to like ridiculous territory here. That's the whole point of yeah. dissecting a teaser because yes. we have no idea. But from what, the way they showed it, it could be just like a little background droid. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It could be something. Oh, yeah. just, it's a it could be oh, a tracking yeah. shot to yeah. something else. But if it is a uh, you know a new droid character. For the series, it looks like it's going to be like a messenger droid. I don't mm. feel like it's an astromech droid that's supposed to be like doing all these kind of an all-purpose thing like R2. Yeah, it's um, kind of like a cute little assistant. Yeah, like something like yeah. you would say, hey, go deliver this message, and it has the little hologram mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. Maybe well, I'm sure it'll have some neat little tricks that it does, but that's what I, that's the impression that I got from it. Yeah. It doesn't well, seem like there's a lot of hidden compartments. Mm-hmm. Aren't they bringing R2 back for this one? I thought they were. They yeah. have to have to bring R2 back. They're going to have to R2 bring confirmed. Them. They can't. <laughs> Trey Cooper confirms R2-D2. <laughs> they are. No, no, they are for sure because they have because to. the, they the have actors to. the actors confirm that they're in the movies. Anthony Daniels and the actor who plays R2. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Great. Because I remember thinking, how are they going to put them in those suits? Because those are not young guys anymore. Mm-hmm. And uh, But they are. I mean, Anthony Daniels said that he wasn't going to do it if they were not going to let him uh, be in the practical suit. I respect that. So, yeah. <laughs> cool, cool. Oh, actually, according to I just looked that up. Um, R two D two was actually the first character confirmed to appear in the movie. Huh. So awesome. we, there you go. <laughs> we've, we've now once again proven we don't know enough about Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> hey, R two is the only character who's not ever embarrassed himself in any movies that I, across all six. I agree completely. Oh no, I think that one incident on Dagobah might have been. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, he did kind of like do that thing where he squirted a. Uh, oil over there and mm. all over the ship in episode two I think it was mm. or episode three that was kind of ridiculous but <laughs> I, he came out okay when he rescued everyone yeah well he he's always been a comic relief character so he, he has a different expectation than say um, Darth Vader you know with Anakin the right. expectation yeah. is so high uh, he's not supposed to be a jokey character he's not supposed to be a joke but R2-D2 is a, is he's a cool character but he's also comic relief so you can kind of go a lot of different directions with him and it, it works I wonder what they're going to do with um, with R two D two, and this. I mean, this is going to be the the kind of weird valley that you're going to have with bridging these movies, mm-hmm. because you know, obviously, the original series happened a long time technologically before, yes. like, as far as what they could do cinematically. So I wonder what they're going to do with R two D two, since they basically made it to where R two D two has like fifty billion little magic powers. You know, mm-hmm. he can he's a flamethrower and he shoots oil and he has jetpacks now and he can fly and he mm-hmm. pulls everybody out of an elevator shaft. And then really all he can do in the other movies is like beep and barely move in the desert and, and hack know? into something just yeah. in the nick of time. You know? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's like all he could do. So I wonder yeah. if they're going to just retain it where he just has like three or four little things he can mm-hmm. do, or if he's going to be you know full fledged. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All-purpose droid. He, so someone he got a hold of him and like refurbished him like, again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now he doesn't just spit them out. Now he uses them. That's what. Yeah, that's what would happen <laughs> if George Lucas was doing the next one. <laughs> yeah. He, just he becomes R2. the like, Yoda from Attack of the Clones. He just yeah, kinda, like, exactly. jumps around he and just, starts doing flips. <laughs> yeah, you, you just put Yoda's um, animations onto R2-T2's bones yeah. and just see what happens. That would actually look <laughs> awesome. <laughs> it would, probably. <laughs> So, um, so while we're still we're still talking about Star Wars, if we want to transition to some other like recent Star Wars news, um, Trey, do you read any of the uh, or have you read any of the Star Wars comic books? No, I, I can I honestly, the only outside materials that I normally read for anything I is whenever I was 
going all the way through high school, I read like every single Star Trek The Next Generation book ever made. Nice. I read all of them. <laughs> but I never ever read anything else. I don't I normally just don't. Okay. I don't know why. Um but yeah, I, I don't usually read well, books. The the reason I bring it up um based on Breed books based on other properties. Let me right. be very clear. Yeah. Not, books. not books at all. Yeah, yeah. This, this, I can read books. This is your like, confession. I can't read. <laughs> Screw books. <laughs> yeah. No, um, the reason I bring it up is just to kind of show uh, the, the Star Wars uh, you know, fever is starting to kind of build again. Um, this Marvel has announced a new, because of course they have, or technically Disney has the rights, but Disney owns Marvel and they own Star Wars. Uh, so Disney Marvel owns is going, all of us now. Yeah, practically. <laughs> Uh, so Marvel is going to put out a Star Wars, a new Star Wars comic starting in January of next year. Um, mm-hmm. It's going to take place in between A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back with the original cast. Uh, but they've already confirmed that they have projected sales of over one million copies, which is would make it the highest grossing comic of the last twenty years, um, which is kind of significant. So that's kind of why I bring it up. There's there's kind of a whole lot that goes into why it's going to sell that much, even though it's only. Uh, you know, it's, they've been projecting this, and it's like a month out from when it's going to actually hit uh, shelves. Part of that has to do with pre-orders. Part of that has to do with um, there's this new service that they have called. You guys heard of Loot Crate? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So Loot a lot like Loot Crate is actually pretty big in the comic book uh, scene as well. That's how anytime publishers have like a like a number one release, which is a lot because they're constantly um, just releasing like a like a book pretty much the same thing only they just put like a number one on the cover so so it'll sell more and they love throwing those into loot crate packs and they can apparently generate a lot more sales that way um that's one of the ways that they're getting so many so many copies because they apparently i I think if you bought a loot crate between now until like you know a couple of months from now it's probably going to include star wars number one (laughs) at this point it's a good idea uh but it it is a good idea because it does kind of push the property and it gets people to try to read it jump on Mm -hmm. jump on board um uh, but yeah, it is. I, I do think that that even though the number is somewhat inflated, it's still very impressive because currently, if you're looking at uh, the comic book industry and the, and the sales that they have, you're looking at only something around um, 100,000 would be is considered a smashing super success. Like you would, I not necessarily win the month, but you'd be you'd be very close. You'd be in the top uh, right. five books of that month if you sell 100,000 copies, and this is one million. So it's it's a significant figure. Um, I mean, Star Wars has always has always had its it's like a level of hype, and it goes in waves. But it's always there. Mm-hmm. Like I can't. I was born after all the Star Wars movies had come out, and I can't remember a time when there wasn't Star Wars toys yeah. at the toy store. You know, it, Star Wars kind of saved Lego. You know, it, yeah. it was because Lego started doing licensed things, starting with Star Wars, they were able to stay in business. And now it's oh, they're really? bigger than ever. Yeah, and that's how it is. Like that. For all the the knocks against it, business wise, mm-hmm. the guys that are running that department know what they're doing. Yeah, they let it go in waves. They let it kind of calm down. They know exactly what to do to get the fans, and the fans will gripe all the way <laughs> to the toy store where they buy all the toys again. Yeah. <laughs> yep. yeah. Oh, I do the same um, thing. That, that's I'm, I'm like, not oh, gonna buy a stupid <laughs> Jar Jar action figure because uh, they just made yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I bought a um, I bought for for my son a. Um, a uh, R2-D2, like a stuffed R2-D2 that like beeps, like it does all the beeps whenever nice. you hug him. Uh-huh. And I got it whenever they came, one of the, I can't remember, one of the movies came out, so they released all the things again. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm just going to buy all these <laughs> Star Wars toys again. Yep. I mean, they even have the uh, Angry Birds Star Wars, which incidentally I think uh-huh. is probably one of the better Angry Birds entries. Yeah, it is. Because mm-hmm. um, they actually added new mechanics. <laughs> which well, I, awesome. The Star Wars Mr. Potato Head. Mm-hmm. I mean, Star Wars... Has gotten into it, it's kind of like it's kind of like almost what Lego has done, where mm-hmm. Lego has like now become so meta mm-hmm. that you're buying like toys that are like Lego fied. Yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're buying Lego Mister Potato Head, mm-hmm. where it's a toy that looks like a different toy. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's it's a it's a part of the culture now. Mm-hmm. Mashups. While we're still talking about Star Wars, um, there's been still a lot of um, talk and worry about the Disney acquisition and what they might end up doing with the property. Uh, mm-hmm. So so far, I think that it's it seemed to me at least to be pretty positive and respectful. But whenever yeah. you have Disney involved, and whenever you've got like such a large company that has their their you know fingers in so many pies, there's that that worry that they're going to start 
um, diluting the franchise by um, doing a whole bunch of like crossovers. At least for me, it's something that I worry about. Doing a whole bunch of crossovers with all their other properties, like you know, Luke Skywalker meets Mickey Mouse meets uh, Wolverine and Spider-Man meets like the people from Kingdom Hearts or whatever. I don't, I don't even play that game. I know but, Kingdom Hearts is a pretty popular franchise. I, I'm actually right, so I'm, that's that's something that kind of worries me. I, I, I see I see your worry, but I'm actually okay with Kingdom Hearts doing it. <laughs> I, um, I actually want to see a Kingdom Hearts where you can go to Marvel and Star Wars. Worlds, yeah, I, so I actually kind of have, and I won't get into all of it, but I, I really, really dislike uh, that aspect of Kingdom Hearts. I feel that it kind of dilutes. And I'm actually not anti Disney. I like a lot of Disney films, but I, I just I thought that was the whole point of Kingdom Hearts. Yeah, well, to go into all these. <laughs> yeah, but but it's to me, it sort of it kind of dilutes the each individual universe by having all these like cross universe um, shenanigans. It kind of makes it seem like every every individual universe becomes less special because they're all part of this bigger whole. Um, that's partially my own perception of it, but it's also, it's a combination of that and um, the sort of like the weird Square Enix like characters that they throw in there with like key yeah. weapons and all that that I don't really, I can't really get behind that. I, I can see that argument. I just know that I'm like an absolute sucker for crossovers. <laughs> yeah. um, so if you have a crossover, like and the, the more things you're crossing over, the better. Um, I just eat that shit up. So, yeah. well, and that, the thing from the thing that has proved me always wrong, and I'm I'm a huge even even though a lot of their films have not gotten the critical acclaim they used to. I'm a huge fan of Pixar. I mean, obviously, a lot of people are, mm-hmm. but I've I've actually loved a lot of the kind of more experimental things that they've done recently. Um, like Cars too. No, that's yeah. not what I was going to say. I was going to say the opposite of that. That's like a good Pixar. So. That's, um, that's just a pet project of what's his name because he loves cars so much <laughs> that he just doesn't care. But um, as it, uh, Lassiter, that's who yeah, owns John, John Pixar, Lassiter. right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so whenever um, uh, they pretty much brought him on to run Disney, mm-hmm. you know, I – I honestly would trust them with anything after that happened. I mean, I think he's a, a creative visionary. I think mm-hmm. he also knows how to run a company. I think he adores Disney. Mm-hmm. I think he would run that company as if he was Disney's own child. <laughs> um, and I think it's he's proven it. I think that the films that Disney has put out now are excellent. Mm-hmm. And in fact, Disney is, I think, now making movies that are more consistently good than Pixar is. I, I agree. Uh, I would agree with yeah, you. Yeah, sure. So, um, and as far as diluting the 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 universe to where because we have so many Star Wars movies all of a sudden it's not special mm-hmm. it's not neat that's exactly what I thought whenever Marvel started making their movies and they mm-hmm. were so intertwined mm-hmm. and the directorial style other than dialogue and like some tiny little things mm-hmm. it's interchangeable you can't really tell they all mm-hmm. look visually the same mm-hmm. yeah um, I and every single time I tell people I'm like you know what I don't even think I'm excited about this new Captain America I've already seen enough of them mm. then I always go see it and then I always love it and yeah. I'm like oh so I, I actually really like how the, the and we've talked about it, a, bit, a bit about this on the podcast before um, about how the Marvel movie universe is kind of its own um, like if you don't follow the comics you can still kind of follow these character arcs and stuff like that as if you were consuming comics just right via the movies exactly so that's why I feel like it works kind of the same way Mm -hmm. and as long as they they put out good quality products Mm -hmm. then you have I mean and obviously Guardians of the Galaxy felt different had a different visual style different energy to it than the other Marvel movies and they'll be able to keep doing that I mean there's there is a huge amount of characters so they'll be able to keep changing it up and then you know putting out consistently good movies all the time Mm -hmm. and I think that the way that Disney is setting up the Star Wars universe is similar, mm-hmm. and I think that they are definitely—I um, mean, they're doing this very—they're doing the same thing, basically. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They're—they're they're using smaller directors for the smaller things, kind of indie-ish directors, uh-huh. and then it's, you know, big, established, good name directors for you know the launching post of the franchise. Um, so I know another topic we wanted to discuss today was uh, Dragon Age Inquisition. Um, mm-hmm. We actually did a podcast, Jim and I. Um, a couple weeks ago where we uh, went through the Dragon Age Keep and set up our own world state. The Lost Um, Podcast? Is that the one you're referring uh, to? No, that was was after the Lost Podcast. (laughs) Oh, that's right. Yeah, Um, that one was was not lost. (laughs) Right. (laughs) The Found Podcast. In fact, it it has been aired. Um, And we talked about the Lost Podcast on that one. So... Um, 
but yeah, so we, we went through and we set up our world states, um, or we set up a world state for backward compatible. Kind of, we had a couple mm-hmm. of character concepts in mind and made a thing. Um, I've not been playing with that world state because I was playing with the one that I set up based on my time with Dragon Age One and Two. Yeah, um, and I understand you've been playing Inquisition a bit. Yeah, I have. A surprisingly large bit. I mean, you're lucky that I actually left my house and went anywhere today. <laughs> well, well, thank you for coming. Um, uh, how many hours are uh, hours in? Are you? You know, I, I have no idea. Mm. I, it doesn't tell you when you like load the game up, and all I do is pick. And, and I have an Xbox One, so it, I obviously haven't been playing anything else. Mm-hmm. So I'll go watch TV or whatever, and then just snap back to it. It's oh, right. I see. It's right where I'm I gotcha, at. I gotcha. I gotcha. Um, so I don't know how many hours. I know that I got it. The first the day it came out, mm. and um, other than doing my daily raids and Destiny, that's mm. it. That's all I've been playing. Gotcha. But I don't so, think story wise, I'm very far. Mm. Um, without spoiling too much, have you gotten to uh, Skykeep yet? Skykeep, uh, your castle? Mm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Because um, I just got there myself. Oh so yeah, we're getting past that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you get a castle. I'm, it's awesome. I'm kidding. I, I, actually, I don't. I don't care. I don't really care about spoilers, to be honest. Um, it's per- it's perfectly cool. Although some of our listeners might, I guess. So we'll, well, we, 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 we'll we hey, the game's been out for a long time, people. So <laughs> we we have said on the show before that we do spoilers, um, and true. so spoiler alert for anyone listening: there might be things that might. Um, ruin your game experience. Uh, you may or may not get a big, <laughs> giant, amazingly awesome castle. <laughs> and also, uh, Darth Vader is actually Luke's uh, father, in case, uh, yes. you in case you plan on watching know. Star Wars at any point. <laughs> and the Titanic sinks and the English patient dies. And Snape kills Dumbledore. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So well, now we got that out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, um, I, so I what are your... Uh, I, haven't, I haven't played the Dragon Age Inquisition. Sorry to cut you off there, Chris. Um, I haven't played no Dragon problem. Age Inquisition yet. I did play the first two. Um... But uh, um, I know that, that Chris has had sort of we've had a discussion uh, via Twitter about uh, the the sort of slow start to the game. Um, mm-hmm. Chris Chris said it takes it takes about eleven hours at least for him for him to kind of get drawn into the game. I kind of called yeah. it an eleven hour prologue, uh, <laughs> yeah. which kind of worried me because I, I'm planning to eventually get the game, um, just not until it you know reduces in price a little bit. But uh, would you say that that you had a similar experience with the game being kind of a slow having a slow start? Right? Yeah, I actually chimed in on his whenever he posted that and said I, I felt very similar. Mm-hmm. The thing is, though, it wasn't like the last Final Fantasy game where the like the first billion hours of the game just felt unbearably like a tutorial. Yeah, yeah. and I didn't even make it through that. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you read Penny Arcade had a really funny comic about that, like how long it was. Wait, which Final Fantasy? Which one? Uh, you mean? Uh, the last like number. Oh, thirteen. Yeah, thirteen. Okay. Yeah. Oh god, yeah, I didn't like thirteen at all. That that did have a very long kind of like. It, it wasn't like the second to last chapter, and granted, the chapters get longer. Right. Um, it was like the last three chapters. You had the ability to actually explore an open world. Everything else was just hallways. I, yeah. And I and I <laughs> never. Um, I I had really fond memories of watching people play Final Fantasy because my parents went through a phase for a long time. Mm-hmm. It's longer than a phase. It was <laughs> it was a long period of time. Right. Um, where they didn't allow any video games at all. Mm. So, like, they sold my NES at a garage sale, and then I was not allowed to play video games at all. The reason I got to play those computer games was because I'd buy them on the black market in Peru, <laughs> and I'd wait till my parents got, went to bed, and I'd install them, and then I'd erase them every night. <laughs> so Nice. Um, Gamers but, find a way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I didn't get to play Final Fantasy when it was, like, in its heyday, like when it, well, I guess it still kind of is, but like you know, when it was first coming out, mm-hmm. but I watch, I'd watch people play it, and I had all these amazing, uh, like, ideas about what Final Fantasy could be and what it represented, and people would tell me all the stories about the adventure. So I had this really, I don't know, like, like I had this weird nostalgia for Final Fantasy that mm-hmm. I actually never got to play. Right, right. And then the first game that I actually bought of my own was Final Fantasy Thirteen. Right. And I just found it unbearably like <laughs> boring and stupid mm. I just couldn't like my friends would be texting me they'd be like oh my god I love he has a chocobo in his hair I'm like no he has a little chicken in his hair that's not that's dumb that, that's not a good game make. Yeah. <laughs> um, so kind of returning to um, Dragon Age did you ever play uh, the previous games in the series I Dragon Age 1 I was so excited about I think it came around on the tales of what, Mass Effect 2 or was it before Mass Effect 2 um, Origins came out before two, I believe. Well, it definitely came out after Mass Effect one. Uh, yeah, so I, think so I was already a huge Bioware fan. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So I was really looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. And then I got it on the Xbox, and I had already read a little bit, mm-hmm. but um, it just looked like dog shite on the consoles, oh, yeah. in my opinion. It, it was bad. Especially coming off of playing Mass Effect, which looked gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it just looked crappy, mm-hmm. and I am absolutely, whenever I get on those, on, see like comments and threads where people are like, I don't care about graphics, blah, mm-hmm. blah. I'm like, then play your old consoles. Yeah. I want there to be, <laughs> yeah. if I'm playing a AAA title, mm-hmm. I expect AAA <laughs> graphics engine. I, 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 I appreciate graphics to an extent. Like, I'm not one of those people who's like, oh, graphics don't matter at all. It's like, yeah. no, I want it to look pretty. Um, I don't want it to look bad. Is more what I want. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Like, I don't mind. I don't mind. Like I played through like Pini- especially Penny Arcade's newest games, the mm. ones that were kind of like the model after old school mm. RPGs. I don't mm-hmm. mind different aesthetics. Mm-hmm. I don't need it to be whatever. Yeah. But yeah, if you're that game didn't look good. Mm-hmm. It did not look like a. It did not look like a triple A title from a triple A studio. Yeah. Um, so that was a huge knock against it. First mm-hmm. of all, mm-hmm. I do not like tactical combat mm. in. RPGs. Mm-hmm. I don't like it. I don't like it in any game. Mm-hmm. It's not, just not my style. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So I didn't like that. It got really hard for me because I'm not very good at that kind of style. So, so just to sort of clarify what you mean here. So you liked, did you like Mass Effect? Love Mass Effect, yeah. Okay. So you're, you're probably like me where like you want to be able to basically play it like just an action game. Right. Yeah. And then, like, you have the option to be tactical. Exactly. Um, yeah, and Origins definitely didn't feel that way. You couldn't. Right. And it made me not, and I didn't understand it also. That was the hardest thing. I literally could never wrap my mind around how I was supposed to be doing the combat. Yeah, yeah. I was like, am I supposed to even ever control my character? Yeah. Or am I just supposed to have them automatically do things? Mm-hmm. I just didn't. I, I never clicked with me how the combat was even supposed to work. Yeah. I always felt stupid. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. <laughs> yeah. I actually turned the uh, difficulty down to casual just because I wanted to get through the game. And I was yeah. like, you know what? I'm tired of being stuck on this one fight. Just get me through the story. <laughs> yeah. So. I think I, I didn't. I got stuck on a fight, and then um, I was done. Mm-hmm. I mean, it lost me. I liked the story. I liked the universe. Mm-hmm. Um, then Dragon Age 2 came out. A lot of people really hated it. Mm-hmm. I really liked the combat a lot more. Mm-hmm. Got about halfway through that, too, mm-hmm. and then realized that the story wasn't going anywhere, <laughs> and I didn't care enough. If you only got halfway through, like, kind of about two-thirds is where, like, important stuff starts happening. Yeah. Um, and I got basically just past that and then kind of lost interest, um, and then my hard drive got wiped before I can come back and finish it, and I just didn't want to play all the way through it again. Yeah. So, so you're I, saying I Dragon remember. Age 2 is, like, two-thirds prologue? Yeah, <laughs> in a sense. Actually, it's split up into three acts, very, um, very explicitly. And the first couple of acts have important stuff in them, but I think it's really Act Three that it's like the game was designed to get Act Three across to you. And yeah. I think by then, a lot of people might have just been tired of it. It was so. bored. I just I, like again, it was one location, mm-hmm. kind of very similar things. Mm-hmm. It felt like the whole thing was a setup for this game. Yeah. They were playing Which now. Which it kind of was, <laughs> especially as you play through um, Inquisition. You kind of see, um, to their credit, there's a lot of good um, uh, shout-outs to basically things yeah. that had happened before. Um, did you go through the keep and make a custom state, or did you just kind of go with the default? No, I went like, and I wish that I would have done that. And it's because I don't. I'm I'm always a sucker for anything like this. Mm-hmm. Like I'm one of those people who, if I have the money at all mm-hmm. or a way to get the money, mm-hmm. I'm going to get it the day it comes out. Sure. Like I just need to. Uh-huh. And so I was like reading, they're like, oh yeah, if you have this EA Access thing, I was like, oh, I'm never getting this. It's the <laughs> worst deal ever. I can play an old FIFA game for free. Mm-hmm. Um, like, but you can play Dragon Age if you sign up for free membership, mm-hmm. you know, five days early. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay. I, and so I played it the eight hours, I think you got eight hours that you can ah. play. So I played it over the weekend before it came out. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, yeah, I'm buying it. Mm-hmm. So I already had gotten about to that point. I gotcha. And I actually reset my character. Mm-hmm. I didn't like the, like I got eight hours in. Mm-hmm. And realized I hated the way my character looked. Yeah, <laughs> mine is pretty ghastly. I think it's because like they have like this really white light mm-hmm. um, when they're in the character creation. So I'm like, okay, I don't want to be too pale. Yeah, and so I, I ended up being like Middle Eastern tan. Yeah, <laughs> well, I was like, I guess I'll just live with it. I, I was trying to make like a uh, like a almost like an anime looking like gaunt mm. uh, dwarf or elf character uh-huh. with like white hair uh-huh. who was like young and had like all scarred. And I had this whole backstory in my mind. Mm-hmm. I made it for him, and then like. As the game was going through, it just he didn't look like what I thought. He had this real dopey, <laughs> real too long face. And that, that always his, happens his lips to me in and aspect it, yeah. <laughs> So I was like, I'm done. I, I couldn't do it. Yeah. So I remade it, and I was like, I'm going to play through this as a woman, which I'm super, really glad I had. I've never done that. I've tried to do it in Mass Effect mm-hmm. during second playthroughs. I just didn't feel like mm-hmm. I was feeling like I was the character. Okay. But in, in Mass Effect, I mean, sorry, in Dragon Age, the cool thing about it for me is I am the Inquisition. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. while I have a 
you know, certain fondness for the character that I created, mm. I'm always switching between the characters because different battles might need be more mage focused. So mm. I might be playing as Dorian more. Mm. Mm-hmm. So I feel like I'm the Inquisition, mm-hmm. like I'm the party, which is really unique. I haven't ever felt that even in Mass Effect games. I always was Shepard, right, and these right. weren't my friends. Right. Yeah, Whereas this, it, um, I actually have something to contribute to this part because I haven't actually played the game. But when you say that you actually get to, you know, you feel like you're controlling the party and you're playing as the party, that actually gets me really interested because. Those are the, the, the RPG mechanics that I really enjoyed in uh, some of Bioware's older releases, like the Icewind mm-hmm. Dale series and Baldur's Gate in particular. Yeah. So if, they're, if, if they move back in that direction, that gets me uh, a lot more interested in the game because I am one of those more um, one of those people that does enjoy um, the, the, a tactical based um, combat, planning out how your, your strategy. I should I shouldn't say tactical because that that's kind of that, that sort of has um, other implications wrapped up into it, but I do like the strategic element of RPG combat, uh, party-based RPG combat, which is something that was kind of missing from, especially Dragon Age Two, and you never really get that feel in Mass Effect. But you definitely, I mean, it's still it's still more casual combat. Mm-hmm. You can switch to the tactical view; it doesn't work that well, mm-hmm. especially in tight, confined views. Um, but it works good enough. Mm-hmm. I mean, I definitely make use of it during harder battles, but. Um, yeah, I definitely I thought that was, a, and that's really good because, like you know how you said that the character creators kind of has this weird lighting to it. Yeah, and Solomon's probably gonna get really annoyed whenever he hears me go over this again. <laughs> but um, so I made my character, and I was like, I made this the, her look good. I didn't want her to look like she was a, some kind of like <laughs> doll girl or anything. I wanted her to look like a warrior, <laughs> and like I got out into the bright light of day, <laughs> and it looks like she has like so much pink makeup on her cheeks <laughs> yeah. like so much like she honestly it looks like she like got drunk and put her makeup on and is like walking the streets of Tijuana like it's it's awful and I, yeah. and I but I, I I thought I was okay with it and then sometimes when it was in the dark light I'd be okay and by the time I realized that like, I was not okay with the way she looked at all <laughs> and there was not going to be any place where I could change right. like come on why in the world can she not just go up to her quarters in the castle and you can change the makeup? Yeah, it's under yeah. the makeup section. Yeah, I'm a like, man. I, I, don't, I don't need to change the face yeah. shape. I just want to change. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I don't know how to put makeup on. I was like trying to apply <laughs> blush. And, you know, yeah. it looked fine in the character. I didn't couldn't see it. Mm-hmm. And then I was just trying to add, like, some depth to the some, whatever. I'm not an artist. Mm-hmm. I shouldn't have tried to do that. <laughs> so, yeah, my, the, my Inquisitor, whenever she's out in the sunshine, she has bright pink <laughs> blush on her cheeks. Fun. If he's even called blush, <laughs> I, th- I think it is. <laughs> we're, we're not a uh, we're not a makeup show here. <laughs> yeah, something I wanted to um, touch on regarding Inquisition, and um, this comes back to uh, like Jim mentioned. I was telling him that. Uh, it, there was kind of like this 11 hour prologue right quote unquote. um and of course some of that was probably idle time you know just mm-hmm. menus being open that sort of thing um so it probably wasn't quite that long um but what it reminded me of is uh when i played the original uh well not the original but the first fire emblem that came out in the u.s mm-hmm. um fire emblem awakening um a lot of rpgs tend to do this thing where you kind of have like a shorter campaign that kind of sets you up for the main campaign right um and this one definitely has that um Unfortunately, I found it to be a bit slow for my taste, um, and I think what the reason being is that um, they're kind of like bringing back the sort of open world thing. You go to a zone and you find quests out in the world, and you perform right. those quests out in the world. Um, and I think that's really great for uh, kind of like the explorer or the completionist sort of player archetype. Um, for me, as like kind of a narrative guy, um, I kind of want to get to like the narrative. Right. Um, and so when I hit that mark where um, like the Inquisition becomes like the Inquisition and you get your castle and mm-hmm. all that sort of stuff, um, that's when it was kind of like, okay, it's on. This is going to yep. be cool. Um, but up until that point, it's kind of like, okay, I mean, I'm not really feeling this. I'll hang in there, you know, because um, I mean, it was interesting enough to keep me going. It wasn't like it was so terribly boring that I went to just like yeah. be like oh screw this game yeah um but it wasn't it, it it felt slow and i'm one of those people that kind of needs an interesting plot to drive me through mm-hmm. something rather than just saying like oh i'm just so glad to be able to explore yeah. this mountainside you know that sort of thing well i i can say that i used to say i hate open world games mm-hmm. because i felt like open world and it's one it's a thing that you hear all the time now that developers say They'll, they'll be shown the demo and they'll say, and just so you know, anywhere you see you in can the horizon, you can go there. <laughs> and I'm yeah. like, holy shit, I don't want <laughs> to do that. Yeah. If That's what life is like. You know what I mean? There's too many decisions. There's too many places I can go. Yeah, yeah. I want you to take me to neat places that mm-hmm. you handmade. Uh-huh. Um, so I was I was pretty nervous about, about 
the game whenever I, before I played it. Mm-hmm. And I was like you. When I first started, mm-hmm. I was like, there's a kind of neat little thing at the beginning with the whole mm-hmm. rift and you go, whatever, the little prologue mission. Mm-hmm. And that was cool enough. Mm-hmm. But I still felt like it was hampered by the fact that it was an open world game. So, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the cutscenes didn't seem as tight. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. The engine yeah. just didn't seem as, as robust as it could have been if they would have made it not an open world game. Sure. But then um, I started actually doing things that people always say that happen in open world games, which is I started having these weird adventures of my own yes. on my way to go do something. Uh-huh. But they were they were things I wanted to do, not like, oh, if I don't do this. Because mm-hmm. I don't like that it hang, like, looms over my head yeah, when I have too like, many oh, quests. Oh, I, I need to get experience. Yeah, yeah. So let me go do the stupid quest. But know? it would like be like, and it, it's not uncommon. Like I don't, I still can't put my finger on why I like it so much more than like a game like Skyrim. Mm-hmm. But like. I, there was this one thing at the very beginning in the hinterlands, one of the opening areas, uh-huh. and it was like I went to a house and I found a note, and it was like some guy's brother, and they were in a feud, and you know the the Templars hate the mages, yeah. and the brother had found out that his other brother was a mage, and he was trying to get him to meet so he could kill him, and mm-hmm. um, I just had to know if he really went and killed his brother, mm. so like I went looking for these people that I didn't huh. know, and it, I was like way high level above where I should have been right, I right. was like level 2 uh-huh. so I think that was like and then I got attacked by a bear and, and yeah <laughs> the bears dude I was like what just happened no, like, the, I, I was trying to set up camps in the hinterlands yeah. and I couldn't get that one out in the woods because of all the freaking bears it's like it, uh, is, does this level have like five different like you know like tiers of difficulty yeah. or something no the, the animals will murder you yeah the people are fine but the yeah. animals <laughs> yeah. and then that's that's another thing like um, there's a side mission in um, not the Storm Coast, but one can't remember, one of the locations. Mm-hmm. It's a side mission. It's a main side mission. Mm-hmm. It gives you a lot of experience and stuff. But where you have to like uh, drain that lake mm. to like close up. Did you see that? Or? I don't think I did that one. No. Okay. Well, it's a huge quest, and that you don't even have to do that. Mm. And it's it's like it's awesome. Nice. It is so awesome. Like you mm-hmm. go through, you go underneath this lake, mm-hmm. and you have to like drain it by breaking down this dam. It's just a really cool, and it's completely you awesome. know, optional. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the characters grow on you. And mm-hmm. like at first, I did not like any mm-hmm. of my initial party, uh-huh. which also was how it was in Mass Effect. Yeah. But um, didn't like them at all. But then I got, like, Dorian and Sarah mm-hmm. and, like, some of the more interesting characters. And just like all good Bioware games, mm-hmm. you bring them up. You pick who you want your friends to be. Sure, yeah. I, I know that I shouldn't have mm-hmm. two mages and two rogues on my team, <laughs> but yeah. that's who I want to hang out with when I'm on the mission. So yeah, yeah. might be a little bit harder. And, yeah, they don't really do, like, some RPGs, it's like you always know that it's essential that you have at least one of every class because yeah. there's going to be something that you can't do without this class, like, you know, for instance, picking a lock because you need yeah. a rogue or something like that. Um, and that is present to a certain degree, but only in, like, certain spots. Yeah. And you can really get away with not doing that. Yeah. Um, usually there are more than one ways or – yeah, more than one way to um, get to that secret area yeah. that's blocked off. So yeah, usually if you've got at least two classes, you're fine. So yeah, well, I got a I got a party that I like. Mm-hmm. I like talking to them. I like going back to the castle. Mm-hmm. I I can't believe how huge the game is still because I feel like I'm really far into the game mm-hmm. and I know that I'm not because I haven't. I unlocked only one throne and there's like 50 thrones and oh, I'm like okay. really excited to unlock another throne. I know it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, and then like curtains. I'm like, oh, I can't wait till I get some new <laughs> curtains for my for my castle. Um, just out of curiosity, have you been to uh, Seralt yet? Seralt, where is that? Um, I think it's in Orlay, like kind of like north western Orlay. I don't think so. Um, there was kind of like a, a mission where you can start scouting it out, and then they sort of hint that you might be there later. Um, I'm wondering if that's like a core part of the game, or if that might be part of. Um, there's this collaboration between um, uh, Fail Better Games, who created um, uh, the Story Nexus engine. They did um, Fallen London stuff like that. They're kind mm-hmm. of like they're kind of a cult hit. Like people who know them know them. Other everyone else has never heard of them. Yeah, I never heard of. But them. But they uh, they did a collaboration with Bioware where they created kind of this text driven adventure in their style. Um, oh, really? That is kind of a uh, yeah. It's a bit of a it's a bit of a prelude to uh, Inquisition. Mm-hmm. Oh. And uh, so it takes place between two and Inquisition, and you play as uh, this noble who's in charge of this town of Seralt. Um and. I've like started scouting out the town, but I haven't actually been there yet because I don't think I've gone to the place in the game where I can be there. Um, I'm curious to see if maybe that only appears if you've done this thing. Um, and if so, to what degree it remembers your choices from this thing because it actually says that it saves your results to the keep. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to see how much of that actually stays. In the like, game. have you actually gone to this place or you scout, sent the people from the war like, room it, there? It, yeah, it's kind of like, um, it, it's in the war room. It's not even the thing, like, for instance, when you first get the Hinterlands, it's like send, yeah. the, scouting, send the scouting party and then there's like the little 
cut scene where like, yeah. they take out some people and he set up a camp. Um, it was just like one of the missions said, hey, we can send someone here to like make contact. <laughs> I might have done that. I don't yeah. remember. Um, they're like known for their glass works or something like that. So I tend to wait till I'm about to go to sleep and then just send my people in like the long, really yeah, long way. Come back go in the to morning. Bed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I don't, I don't, I don't really know if that's if that's gonna mm-hmm. come into it. I don't, I don't really know. I'm still, I don't know where the story's going, which I really like because mm-hmm. a lot of people said that the overarching story was boring mm-hmm. or not as good as the ind- individual character moments, mm-hmm. which I guess is kind of true. But I really find I like the overarching story a lot, and mm-hmm. I love. I always have loved the Dragon Age universe, and I've just always been so sad there wasn't a game that I wanted to play mm-hmm. in this world. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, I really like it. Now, did you have you got to the part? You already got your castle, mm-hmm. so I just really want to talk about this one little thing. Sorry, okay, sure. Um, the part where um, spoiler, <laughs> mild, mild spoiler mm-hmm. alert. The part where um, you go to try and talk to uh, the mages, and you find out that, like they're being controlled or they've mm-hmm. been entered a pact or something. That's a venture. Yeah, yeah with, um, and then um, yeah, the guy's like been doing time travel magic or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then you get blasted like into the future. The future. The one future. year. One year in the future. Yeah, that's when. That's when I think for me, I realized I was going to really love the game. Mm. And then it was, of course, when you got your castle, when you realized mm. that this was a special game, at yes. least for me. Mm-hmm. But when that happened, even though the mission wasn't that amazing, mm-hmm. it was still really cool. Mm-hmm. The whole idea of it was very cool, yeah. and it was happening very early. And I was like, this is a game where mm-hmm. any kind of crazy, fun mm-hmm. adventure can happen. And that's, I think, that's the moment mm-hmm. for me where I just went from saying. I'm kind of pushing myself to play an open world game, just like I always do. Yeah, yeah. To saying, oh, this actually has a story that's fun. Mm-hmm. To then, this has a story and now huge mm-hmm. like gameplay things that are really awesome. Yeah, I think Bioware is kind of shining in their um, uh, in their quest design and their side quest design, especially because like a lot of times side quests can kind of feel just like she wins. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that it kind of bugged me is in the hinterlands, the first few side missions I found is kind of like go kill the boars, essentially like you know WoW style yeah. sort of do this enough times and you'll succeed sort of quest. Um, but then you start to stumble upon quests that like you might not have known were going to do this or maybe they're kind of like meant to get you to an area. That's the, and then, that's the amazing thing they've done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you start to like actually see this really cool thing that happens in this area that you really didn't have to do. Like you said, right. like the lake draining quest, for instance. Um, I didn't do that one, but there's some really neat stuff that can come out of it. That's why I think Kotaku's article was really awesome mm-hmm. that they said, and I don't say that about Kotaku's article very often. <laughs> yeah, not do we. But it was like... Um, <laughs> Where they said, get the hell out of the hinterlands. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. People that are complaining about how the game is really slow are probably there. Yeah. And it's so true because once you leave there, everything else is not designed. Like, if you play any other game, like let's say Grand Theft Auto is an example, mm-hmm. there's going to be certain kinds of side quests. Racing side quests, mm-hmm. collect these papers side yeah, quests. Yeah. And that's how, Elder, that's how uh, the Elder Scrolls games are set up. Everything has these specific kinds of side quests. Mm-hmm. This game does also. But it designs them in a way that they put you into mm-hmm. actual cool. Mm-hmm. So they didn't have to worry about designing these quests. What if no one ever mm-hmm. finds this? Mm-hmm. They put guide marks to make sure you got there. So yeah. they might be to you know do the constellation map thing yeah, yeah. or collect the shards. Mm-hmm. But the shards not going to just be like on top of a cliff always. Mm-hmm. The shard might be like in a dragon slayer mm-hmm. or you know at, in the belly of an alligator. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah. You don't know what they're going to do with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that kind of ties into something I've noticed. And I haven't played enough to like really be able to say this with any certainty. Um, but, you know, it's not a purely open world a la Skyrim mm-hmm. where like you can just like go to different areas and it's just one big connected world. It's you've got a map and you've got kind of like these open areas they can go to. So, so much they, prefer that. The, yeah, prefer which so is I, th- I think it's really good because what's nice is they can design a a level, even though it's still open world, mm-hmm. um, which I think is good. Um, but also each area seems to have its own kind of like personality and its own story and each of the different side quests that you get um, seem to fit a sort of theme for that zone um, that then like makes each zone feel like a unique experience and not just like a reskin of the same thing you've been doing. Yeah. Um, an example is um, when you go to the um, Dire Marshes I think it is yeah. or something like that um, you've got like all the undead in there um, and you know it seems like it's a relatively small zone like the yeah. established camps is only like two camps you can establish. Yeah. Um, but you go um, up to like this little thing and you energize with your magic and it's this yeah. beacon and it's like okay so activate all these beacons and along the way you're going to be seeing a lot of interesting stuff yeah. um, which is very different from the Hinterlands which seems to be very much like WoW style yeah. uh, fetch quest well, <laughs> so. and also one thing that I liked about that little the marshes level mm-hmm. is that like you learn the rules of like how the world works mm-hmm. in a way that feels organic like yeah. you learn there 
don't go step in the water. Yes, exactly. Because a million undead are going to come out of the water there. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it feels dangerous. It feels yeah. it feels awful. And then, like, you have the Storm Coast, which is just kind of like a cool, rugged, mm-hmm. Viking-feeling place. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, there could be giants over here. This is a place where giants are and, mm-hmm. you know, giant bears and mm-hmm. other things that are going to murder you. So they do. They have really organic style. Mm-hmm. And also, as far as accessibility goes, um, it seems like they really took that bit of complaining from other games apart, uh, mm-hmm. uh, to heart. I, I don't know if you noticed like how much like fast travel they have. No, it's designed. A ton. <laughs> it's designed in a way to where you have to explore mm-hmm. at least initially, but not where you have to keep ex- going back to the same place. You mm-hmm. already explored it. Yeah. So if you unlocked a fast travel location, mm-hmm. now you can go there. Mm-hmm. And I think that's just a really great balance. Mm-hmm. And like it's so prevalent that in the castle, mm-hmm. there's like. Multiple fast travel locations yeah. there, so they don't even, they're not even going to make you walk upstairs if you don't want to. You <laughs> yeah. just fast travel to your bedroom. Right, right. And what's kind of cool about that, too, is um, uh, they actually, I think, encourage it to an extent because of the way the potions work. There aren't any healing spells. None. Um, well, that's not true. Mm. Um, uh, what's her name? Vivian. Vivian. Yeah, Vivian, If you once you unlock her next level of powers, have you gotten to that part yet? I don't think I have, no. Okay, well, you get to where each character has their specialty power tree. Like the Inquisitor gets the Inquisition. Yeah, the right. mark thing. Right, right. Yeah, so all your characters get that. Everybody does. Mm-hmm. Um, and cool. And hers is, the last one of hers is a healing thing. Oh, okay. It's actually, I think, a res- well, she has a healing one, mm-hmm. and the next was like, resurrect your whole party oh, okay. spell. Because I know she has the revive, and she has, like, the barriers, but not really, like, a healing spell in the traditional sense. Yeah, I think she, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, I, maybe um, you didn't have a healing spell. But I mean, again, maybe that's your specialty thing. Yeah. Because um, I haven't unlocked that yet. Um, but it seems like because the potions are the only way to heal, yeah. practically speaking, yeah. um, and you got a limited uh, cash that's shared among the party, you kind of need to go back to camp to restock. And so what I found myself doing is like going out and doing an objective or two, um, and then fast traveling back to a camp, and then sort of setting out in a slightly different direction to yeah. the next objective over there. So um, it doesn't feel quite so much as you have to like... Um, uh, go on your excursion and be prepared to stay out for a very long time without being able to return to camp because fast travel is so convenient in that regard. Yeah. Did you, by the way, do the the quest where you go to the, the Empress's like ball, the masquerade ball? Um, I don't know about that one. I know that I met um, Vivian in kind of a party along yeah. those lines. Is that the one? No, it's a huge mission. Oh, okay, like, probably yeah. probably not. Okay. There. Yeah. Just make sure that you take the right team there because there's no potions there mm-hmm. and it's a very long mission and there's like three very very hard boss battles in the middle mm-hmm. of that awesome learn that the hard way cool um so probably time to start winding things down here uh jim do you have any questions regarding uh inquisition or any comments based on what you've heard uh not really i mean there wasn't a whole lot i could contribute because i haven't really played it um but uh i mean it sounds interesting I, I've, I've heard some things i like and some things i don't so uh, I'll, I'll be waiting probably uh, unless they have a, a Steam sale at Christmas, I'll probably be waiting a little bit longer to play it. But uh, mm-hmm. I'm not in any major hur- major rush to play it. Um, it seems like it, it could be a really enjoyable game for me, but um, I haven't liked some of Bioware's recent efforts lately, so mm-hmm. um, maybe not. Might be worth mentioning. I've heard um, not great things about the PC version. I don't know which one you're playing. Xbox One. Uh, Xbox One, yeah, I'm playing on PS4. Um, so it sounds like the console versions were kind of their focus, and that the, P- the PC version might have been a bit of an afterthought. Um, lots of complaints about bugs um, and the controls not being optimized. Like, a lot of people are saying that uh, keyboard and mouse just doesn't work. You have to play with a gamepad on PC. Which is the opposite of Dragon Age Origins. Yeah, exactly. Um, so just, you know, be forewarned. They might have been patching some things to make it a little bit better on PC. Um, but it sounds like right now console is probably the safest way to go. Current-gen console, not last. See, I don't even have a current gen console, so ah, that's well, not even relevant for me. <laughs> you don't get to, you don't get to play yeah. it then. So, like, sorry, Jim. Well, I don't. <laughs> I mean, honestly, for that sort of an RPG, I would prefer to play with the mouse and keyboard. But then again, it is PC, so they'll eventually have some sort of a patch that comes out to fix it. Or if not, the community will do it for them. Yeah, most likely. Well, um, I think they'll about do it for us today. Um, thank you again, Trey, for joining us. Yeah, it's been good to have you. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for joining us. So thank you once again, everyone, for joining us for the Backward Compatible Podcast number 18. Uh, I'm Chris. I'm Jim. And I'm Trey. We'll see you guys next time. We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. You bring unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, share your theories about the Star Wars teaser and what you think of the new Dragon Age.
Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.